We've now seen two philosophical approaches to social justice. The first is the Rawlsian approach, which looks at outcomes and asks, are those outcomes just? And the second is the Nozick approach, which instead of focusing on outcomes, focuses on the process by which those outcomes came about, and then asks, was that process just? Now, when we get together in class, we're going to try to think of some policies that both those who follow the Nozick approach and those that follow the Rawlsian approach might actually agree on. And then we'll think of some policies that they might disagree on. So before we get to class, I'd like you to think a little bit about what kinds of policies might the two camps agree on and what kinds of policies might the two camps disagree on. But before we get there, I'd like to think a little bit about how we actually measure inequality in the real world. And the most common measure of inequality is what we call the Gini coefficient. Now the Gini coefficient is derived from a picture like this, which is one way of graphing a country's income distribution. On the horizontal axis, we have the percentage share of the population, where we line up the population from those with the lowest income to those with the highest income. On the vertical axis, we have the percentage share of income that accrues to the different percentage shares of the population. So if a country's income distribution is represented by this curve, we could read from that curve that the lowest 10% of the income distribution earns about 1 or 2% of total income. The lowest 20% of the income distribution earns about 3 or 4% of total income. The lowest 30% of the income distribution earns about 9 or 10% of total income, all the way up to the 100th percentile, where by definition 100% of the population earns 100% of the total income in the economy. Now we could look at this and ask, what would this curve look like for a country that has a perfectly equal income distribution, where income is evenly distributed between everybody? Well, in that case, the lowest 10% of the income distribution would earn 10% of total income. The lowest 20% would earn 20% of total income. The lowest 30% would earn 30% of total income, and so forth. So this income distribution would then lie on the diagonal. That would represent a perfectly equal society. What about the other extreme, of the most extreme form of inequality, where a single person gets all the income in the economy? Well, in that case, population shares, all of these, would get 0% of total income, all the way until we get to the very last person, who would get 100%. So that income distribution would lie on the horizontal axis and then shoot up on the vertical axis when we get to that very last person. So that gives us some intuition for the fact that as a country's income distribution bends further away from the diagonal and toward this corner, we get increasing income inequality. Now the way the Gini coefficient measures income inequality is that it looks at this area between the diagonal and the country's actual income distribution. And then it takes that area and divides it by the triangle that's formed below this diagonal. So if we had a country with perfect income equality, where income is evenly distributed between everybody, that country's income distribution would lie on the diagonal. So there would be no shaded area, so the numerator would be zero. Zero divided by anything is zero. So if the Gini coefficient is zero, we would have a country with perfect equality. Now what if we had a country with extreme inequality, where a single person gets all the income in the society? Then we've said that that income distribution lies on the horizontal axis and then shoots up on this vertical axis. So the shaded area becomes the entire area below the diagonal. So we would divide the area below the diagonal by the area below the diagonal, which gives us a value of 1. So if we get a value of 1, 
we would have extreme inequality. The Gini coefficient then lies between the values of 0 and 1. And the closer it gets to 1, the more inequality there is as measured by the Gini coefficient. Now, Gini coefficients could use income or consumption or wealth as the measures. And so we can get lots of different kinds of Gini coefficients for a country. And when we get together in class, we'll talk about how to think about the different kinds of Gini coefficients of inequality we could actually measure depending on what exactly it is that we're measuring. But for income inequality, what kinds of measures do we actually get in the real world? Well, it depends what country you're looking at. If you're looking at the Scandinavian countries, of countries like Sweden and Denmark, you would typically calculate an income Gini coefficient of roughly 0 0.26, 0 0.27, or 0.28. If we look at countries like Germany and France, we would typically calculate measures for the income Gini coefficient of around 0 0.33, 0 0.34, 0 0.35. For a country like Brazil, we get a measure in the mid 0.5 range, 0 0.55, 0 0.56, something like that. And for the US, we typically get measures somewhere in the range between 0.45 and 0.5. Now, before I let you go, I'd like you to think about one more thing before you take the quiz. Suppose that I give you two different income distributions in the box like the one that we just talked about. So here's our diagonal of complete equality. And suppose we have one income distribution that looks like this, and another income distribution that looks like this. Now the way I've drawn these, the shaded area is roughly equal for these two income distributions. We get this additional area for the magenta curve down here, but we get this additional area for the green curve up here. The question I'd like to ask you to think about is, if you were a Rawlsian, which income distribution would you prefer? So give that a little bit of thought, take the quiz, and then I'll see you in class.